we are operational here. Let us go ahead and get the clickety click opening. Welcome to Evolution Hour. We're just nearing towards the hour. The site of the clocks and pumps and dials, analog devices representing an ancient world. And welcome to Troubles in Paradise Project, or WordPress.com. Lots of stuff there, free download. Go ahead and and uh, uh, deal with that. Uh, it's all freebies, freebies. Um, hi, all. Uh, it's cold here in Spokane for a couple of days. We've got a kind of sudden cold snap. Apparently, other spots in the country have got snow. Uh, so at least I don't have to worry about shoveling the coal. The cold. I just turn the thermostat up and put on a sweater, and away we go. Um, Jackson, uh, uh, hopefully, will be with us uh, more regularly next week on um, as his hours have shifted uh, in terms of uh, his employment. So he's hunkering down there in Louisiana. And uh, uh, we wish him well, wish everybody well. Um, today's show, as usual, is continuing partly a discussion of the source methods approach, analyzing Hello Slade, um, replacing Darwin, Nathaniel Jensen's not gigantic book. Uh, not in fact uh, that impressively sized in terms of uh, font size either. Um, Assault on Evolution from 2017 that I decided to go through, which doesn't have a reference bibliography, doesn't have an index. So this is a source based analysis that I had done uh, previous on uh, Rupin Sanford's book on um, human evolution, which um, has turned out to be kind of handy for people. Uh, I'm thinking that what we'll want to have ultimately is a network of varying people who are doing source analyses uh, on books that don't have indexes and reference bases in the creationism movement and otherwise so that we can compile and trade this stuff back and forth because it's much easier to do uh, criticism of work when you can find out what's in it and what isn't. And so there's no coincidence that Jensen doesn't want you to find out what's in it all that easily. Uh, this is a particular show um, will be on a section that has literally no references to offer you because he's just going on and on about automobile analogies. So I'll be getting into that in a moment. Hello, David. Um, and uh, then part two will relate to um, Salvador Cordova, who is a um, theistic evolutionist who became an old earth creationist, who became a young earth creationist, who has been popping around and he's a, an amiable fellow. Uh, anyway, he was having a discussion with Dapper Dino uh, back in uh, December, uh, where he just happened to bring up a particular paper uh, by uh, Jean-Baptiste Grotevall from 1907, uh, 19, uh, 2017, uh, which was about um, um, the um, uh, measurement of fitness landscapes in uh, biology and genetics and how supposedly it had all gotten dumped on and eliminated. But it's really a neat little paper. So I'll be putting a look into that. I'll be going into the discussion on that uh, fairly shortly. Just in case we have screw ups on the connection, let me jump right in and thank our patrons right off the bat, which are Hendril, Colton, Eric, Suris, and Zeshi at the colleague level. Our researchers, Travis Adams, Ian Chen, Convert Me, Stephen Early, Neil James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Apologia, Benjamin Simpson, Speed of Sound, Assistant Researchers, Doranku, Totus Real, Christopher Johnson, Friend Little, Daniel, Steve Bauman, Mara Gale, Beddoes, Inset to Cool, Devin Reeves, Martin Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Papalopagus, Bo Rasmussen, Alex Stone, and Paul Williams, and because they helped, I will continue to thank our legacy patrons, Jen and Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nana, Staggles, Sun Sky Stone, Ugly Drum and Truths, Everett and Sewer. Uh, every one of you helped in one way or another, and it's been much easier at a time. I thank everybody who has stuck with the project all of this time, given how dicey finances are and uncertain about COVID and economics and everything else that's going on. So the fact that uh, uh, the supporters have stayed in there has meant a huge amount in terms of making each month bump much, 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 much better. So anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. I would also put his attention to The Rocks Were There and Evolution Slam Dunk. I'm starting work on the detailed uh, Big Slosh, Tales of the Big Slosh chapter for Rocks Volume 2, which is going to be discussing the Mesopotamian flood myths and Behemoth and Leviathan and uh, the formation of the Grand Canyon 
and uh, um, the uh, discussion of ancient civilizations and human spread and why Tower of Babel doesn't explain any of that, all of that, lots of stuff that's going to be in that subsequent book. And uh, along with um, cosmology issues, human evolution, origin of vertebrates, uh, there's, it, it's going to be probably as thick a volume as that. And for those who like fiction, we have uh, the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, mystery science fiction meets uh, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, oh, a whole slew of things are all piling up in that thing. And I'm uh, right in knee deep in the climax section of the second Phileas Fogg novel under the Southern Double Cross, which a little bit of luck, I will have um, uh, taken care of uh, by spring and we will have all of that going. Benjamin Simpson, hi. Um, so what is the nature of Nathaniel Jensen's riff off of automobiles. Um, the automobile analogy has popped up occasionally. It occurred back with uh, Barra uh, in a criticism of creationism back in the 1980s, I think, 70s or 80s, um, which could say that it was just meant as an analogy with how you would um, measure um, change over time. So anybody that he, uh, I think Barra used the example of Corvettes. Uh, where over time, um, if you look at a 1958 Corvette and move into the early 60s and the Stingray and the Manta and all that, as you moved into the 60s and into the 70s and 80s and 90s and all the way up to the modern time, uh, there's an incrementalism to the design, typically in a three-year model cycle, which was very common for design work back in those days. So that although the modern... Um, vehicle doesn't look anything at all like an original uh, Corvette, there's still a corvette to it. And you find this in a lot of design details and that. Well, all of this is our feature of a design system. And Philip Johnson had dumped on Barra, calling it Barra's blunder. And if you Google uh, that every once in a while, you can easily pop up a bunch of anti-evolutionists who uh, run rough job over that Barra's blunder. Um, and that is, of course, that cars are not evolved systems, they're designed objects. All quite true, but what we're talking about is the idea of sequence over time to at least put a benchmark of what changes have taken place, not where the changes come from, that's a different kettle of fish. And so this would relate to things like stratigraphy, it would be a relation of seeing that dinosaurs lived before uh, kangaroos and long after trilobites, and so forth and so on, that there's a sequence to things. And within any group of organisms, you've got turnover and change over time. Now, what's the cause of all of that? Ah, that's where we get into, is it just design or is it a natural lineage? And that goes into the notion that if there are natural lineages involved, involved uh, what is the range of them? And creationists, in effect, uh, allow for evolved lineages. They're called kinds. And they can allow for all practical purposes. Hi, Brian. Um, virtually all examples of uh, living organisms, they can allow huge amounts of variation within, except for us. Got to keep us separate little species. Well, the thing that really becomes interesting when you're dealing with a designed object like an automobile versus a lineage like an evolved life form is, first off, cars don't replicate ever. You could put your Toyota and your Cadillac out in the, the driveway and leave, leave them there till the cows come. They rust to nothing, and you'll never have a little baby hybrid car popping up as a child. They don't replicate. So there can be, in, by definition, no inherited reproductive um, elements, regardless of what the cause of it is, whether it's designed or not. Reproducting systems can theoretically operate as Darwinian systems, which is variation which can be inherited and therefore natural selection can come in, which means now you can start deviating even from a designed object. Now, what's funky about that, and I'll type up another cute little word, cladistics, the dreaded word cladistics, which is a technique for analyzing the relationships of data sets. And as anyone who knows about cladistics uh, in depth realizes, there are no evolutionary assumptions in it. There are no assumptions that you're even dealing with a living system. And, uh, oh, Slade says about a Toyota Prado recently. Um, I will not be discussing Toyotas. 
Uh, my niece has a Toyota. I, I've got a little Honda hybrid, but I will be discussing momentarily Chrysler Imperials and Lincoln Continentals and um, uh, those vehicles, which other than the Lincoln, uh, technically even I think the Lincoln Continental actually is no longer being made as a model. And Chrysler Imperials have disappeared whoop, way long time ago. So this will be a walk down memory lane, but it will be an indication of what the limits are to designed objects and why the automobile analogy that he, um, Jensen went on and on for pages and had footnotes that went on and on for most of a page that had no references whatsoever. He was not citing any on cladistics or systematics, even creationist ones. And so he was just dangling this issue of what it means to be a designed object. And why can't a living organism, like a cow or a horse, be have similarities to almost cows and almost horses because they were designed to look that way. How about that? Uh, had, oh, uh, Brad says, had two uh, um, uh, Celicas, both were good cars. I will give you some historical lesson. By and large, modern cars are really much better than their older counterparts. And the vehicles have gotten way more um, efficient and safer and fuel efficient and um, aerodynamic and comfortable um, and have better handling, better brakes, better um, um, steering, all because of the competition that goes on with various automobile companies. Um, as Brian said, exactly right. The auto analogy is not really useful since it ain't alive. They don't reproduce. So uh, this is the flaw with uh, William Paley's watchmaker argument. And, and by the way, Paley kind of knew um, the issue involved because obviously watches don't replicate. They don't make, they don't make babies. Uh, although his pra his notion back in 1800, and I'll type his little name in there too, so everybody can remember him, <laughs> William Paley. And his books and stuff are available online, I think. Uh, but he was uh, quite an active natural theologian. Uh, and the famous watchmaker analogy is Paley's. So if the analogy being, if you were to find a watch on the beach, well, you would assume that it was a designed object that got left there by somebody. You would never for a moment imagine that somehow or other the watch had come about by some natural means. And so his argument is that um, organisms are way more complicated. And he even recognized regarding that mating thing that imagine how much cleverer the designer has to be to make a watch that replicates, which is what living organisms do. So he felt he had the argument perfectly done. Well, enter cladism. Cladistic analysis can be used to analyze Louis the Fourteenth chairs or motion pictures or anything. You could use it. All it does is take character straight states and allows you to sort them, and it can form nested hierarchies, maybe, or a pile of data where you can't really see a nested hierarchy in them because they're designed objects. And what's quite notorious and has been pointed out by a lot of uh, critics of creationism is that cladistic analysis is not capable of distinguishing a, a lineage nested hierarchy if there ain't one. And that's the case with designed objects. And the reason being because designers can take an idea and borrow it full stop into another bit. So here's where we're going to go down memory lane into the automobiles. Um, in 1961, uh, soon to retire, uh, Virgil Exner at Chrysler came up with his grand new design for the Chrysler Imperial. And, uh, if you Google online, you can easily find pictures of the thing. It had great big fins, of which the Chrysler Imperials had had fins for quite a long time. And, um, it had a very unusual looking front end. Uh, had uh, headlights that weren't even in the body. They were suspended on little modules from the uh, uh, hood. And it was a very peculiar design. And in part, he was doing a homage to a previous design, which were the Cords and Duesenbergs of the 1930s. Very modernized and stylized. And this was the, uh, the great heyday as last big design in 1961. It was used again in 1962 with slightly modified fenders, a little bit less of, of elaborate fins. Uh, and then 1963, just as he was about to retire, um, along comes um, 
uh, the new people at, at uh, uh, Chrysler, and they decide to sh chop the pin off completely. And he had a fit over that. He thought it just absolutely looked hideous. I, I personally like it. I think the 63 uh, Imperial was perfectly fine. But over at Ford Lincoln, they, uh, they had a completely different designer named uh, Elwood Engel and a team of designers working on things. And the 1961 um, Lincoln, unlike the 1961 uh, Chrysler Imperial, looked like a big box on wheels. And everybody has probably seen uh, a variant of the 61 Lincoln because if you know anything about the Kennedy assassination and the famous limousine that he was shot in, that's a 1963 Lincoln. Stretch version, but that's it. It's a big box. And it was it won awards. And it was very distinctive design, and it helped save Lincoln, which was about ready to be bankrupt. Uh, um, uh, Robert McNamara was on the verge of canceling it uh, at that time, and and uh, the design that was used for the '61 Lincoln was actually not intended to be a Lincoln at all. It was actually one of the rival prototypes for the 1963 Thunderbird. And um, uh, that that one or the '61 Thunderbird, it lost out to the one that actually won the electric razor design but, or, uh, that um, came in. And uh, um, so um, uh, Elwood Engel was kind of pissed that he didn't get to have his design uh, used on the Thunderbird. Well, 1964, Chrysler Imperial comes out with their 64 model. And boy, it sure looks different from the 1963 model. It's lean and clean and looks a lot like a, a, a Lincoln, except it's kind of bevel edges. And if you've ever seen the movie, uh, The Green Hornet, in or the TV series, The Green Hornet's car was based on the 1964 Chrysler Imperial. And it, even at the time, I thought, boy, that looks a lot like the uh, Lincoln Continental. Are they trying to copy him? Well, more than that, Elwood Engel had quit Ford and moved to Chrysler. And so he took his design that he intended to be the 1961 Thunderbird and dusted it off. And that made it into the 1964 Chrysler Imperial. Now, all the innards of the Chryslers would have been the same. They would have had the same wheels. They'd have the same transmissions and gear shifts and push buttons and so forth. But the exterior of the vehicle uh, and the shelling and the little uh, trim details uh, were fresh because they had a new designer coming along. Now, that's the kind of what would be called saltational, another cute little word to put in there, saltations, which are big jumps. It was always a big obsession about uh, evolutionary thinking and anti-evolutionary thinking of, what, 50, 60 years ago? That the idea of birds emerging is a saltational jump without any antecedents. And normal evolutionists were always saying, yeah, that's not how it works. Um, and now, of course, we can see the step-by-step -step transition from feather theropods into, into uh, birds that you wouldn't have had. But the thing is that design systems like automobiles or Louis XIV chairs or tarot cards or um, Rolex watches um, can undergo abrupt change, saltational jumps, because designers can just copy something from somebody else. Or the designer who designed the one model can move over to another company and kaboom, the thing changes and the sheet metal alters. Living systems can't do that. That you can imagine um, the traits that are shifting along to produce your finger or your earlobe or your hair follicles or good or bad eyes that require glasses. All of the components of life involve one or more genes usually more. In other words, there are relatively few traits in any biological system that are caused by single traits of genes, let alone single mutations in them. So what happens to produce a variety of form, the morphological sheet metal that would be covering over our bodies in the same way the body covers over the sheet metal in the 64 imperial, that all of those are concatenations of genetic mutations. Now, if you imagine in your head a track of all the different genes in the in the organism and how it starts out and as, as regulatory genes are coming into place and this thing turns into there it's more cells and cell divisions and things coming to play and this connects up to that and that turns that one on and that shifts over to there and the net result turns you from a single cell to things with earlobes and hair and all the rest or in a different organism turns in and eventually produces metamorphosis and you end up with a butterfly um 
even though a lot of the genetic pieces are comparable, homologous um, in uh, the cases, how they're used and how they end up doing stuff varies a lot. Now, in a natural lineage, stuff that is relatively easy to mutate, that can produce little small changes relatively easily, and especially if there's a selection pressure for fixating, fixing that mutation, the odds are that that can might occur more than once in different lineages. That's where convergence comes in. Now, the more components that are involved and the more genes are connected together, the less likely that that's going to be happening as a package to where if you have a well-developed set of variation and mutations the and, and it's showing up there and it's showing up there and it's showing up there, the odds are that it's inherited that and there's little micro adjustments along the lineage. So you can track those character traits and sort them out into all sorts of different combinations. But the one where it looks like, oh, that's a complex trait and it's moving smoothly through that lineage, that's a more likely, more parsimonious explanation than the complicated feature pops up here and here and here and there and there and there independently. And all those features have to come up. So gradually, when you're looking at all the features, the morphology and the genetics, and you're piecing together all these traits that are generated down, even down to the shape of bones and all the other little things that are inside the body. Uh, oh, Slade uh, brought up a question here. Well, I'll have to get to that as soon as I finish my train of thought in here. Um, that cladistics will allow you to measure the likelihood of one lineage being more probable than another because it'll have fewer switches, fewer flips, or very complicated major traits. How did the process of metamorphosis evolve? There's actually, most of the time when we're thinking about metamorphosis, we're talking about insects. Although it does pop up in a lot of invertebrates generally, it doesn't happen in mammals and vertebrates, um, as, a, uh, as far as I know. And so the idea that you have um, an early stage, the initial stage of the organism, and often it's growing and, event and it's not yet ready to breed, and it goes into uh, shutdown mode for a while, reconfigures itself, and then turns into uh, what seems to be a very different organism, caterpillar into butterfly, for example. And that butterfly, the, the finished state may la not last very long. It may be just a breeding module, but basically its job is to go fly out, find a mate, boink, make potential babies, lay eggs, drop dead, and the process continues over and over. Um, I don't know, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I'm not aware of any multiple layers of metamorphosis. In other words, you get kind of the initial stage that leads to a reconfiguration mode in insects uh, and then kaboom um, into a final product. And there's gradations as to how intense that is and what circumstances, how, how it encases and all the rest. So there's, it occurs in a variety of different things. And there's um, a substantial amount of technical literature now on the biology and the genetics of how that works and the deep genes that produce all of that. Um, it's a very novel way of doing stuff that obviously is not necessary for life because we don't do it. Uh, you might argue that there's sort of a metamorphosis that goes on in fungi. Uh, many of the of those things go through different forms where the one stage looks very, very different from another. Um, but we vertebrates are very boring. So an adult form is just a slightly modified, bigger version of the baby form. It's not something where we go in and taste ourselves in a, a cocoon and come out looking entirely different. Uh, and so it's, it's for all practical purposes, that's not going to occur in us. Um, if you look up, let me see if I can find, because I've got my um, um, reference bibliography open here because I'm on my laptop rather than my uh, main computer. Uh, let me type in metamorphosis and let me see if I can find, one of these days I'm going to have to get little connections so I can interconnect all of these little things more easily, metamorphosis. at that and see if, um, if I can find a, a, a fairly recent review that would be uh, helpful. I've got, oh, yikes, over 160 articles that are relating to that. 
and um, yeah, more. Cut that down to a different word in here. Um, oh, Brian Stevens, look up the pro nymphal stage. Ah, you see what's happening. That's uh, that's like that's wonderful to have some help on things. There we go, pro nymphal stage. Uh, I've seen that. Um, um, uh, Javier Bellez uh, had done work in 2011 summarizing a lot of stuff. Uh, um, uh, well, Bernard Degnan uh, in 2010 has done um, roles on kind of like the larger theoretical traits uh, of the uh, field. Um, only in 2012 was there a work working out uh, the pupil genes involved in metamorphosis in a silkworm, uh, uh, homeo domain POU, the ABDA uh, uh, pro. So in other words, only within the last 10 years are they starting to pin down more and more of the genes that do all of that stuff. And um, um, Slade says, uh, Dad keeps asking about butterflies as a gotcha question, and I haven't found the info. Uh, you, part of the answer is that they're just now beginning to work it out. Uh, we have to remember that with it's only within the last 10 or 20 years that they've had the capacity to get genomes for whole organisms. And there's a lot of organisms out there. And trying to work out uh, what the basal groups are and trying to figure out the comparison between systems that are running in ants versus wasps versus bees versus beetles versus you know, blah, 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 all the way down the road. Uh, it's immensely complicated, uh, and uh, but they're gradually individual people who are researching individual organisms are are gradually working their way through, finding out what the genetic systems are, working out what the evolutionary history of that is, and for all practical purposes, none of that work is being done by anti-evolutionists. They're just kibitzing from the sideline, and will probably play very little role in it whatsoever. So. Uh, where we will be in 20, 30, 40, 50 years on the evolution of metamorphosis as a biological system in uh, invertebrates. Um, if I were a creationist, I wouldn't be betting that we won't know a hell of a lot more on that. So there we go. Um, a lot of a lot of features aren't uh, terribly well known in biology. Um, in um, that wonderful little evolution slam dunk book that I mentioned, uh, I had a section on ants where, um, because Michael Denton was bringing them up, that the, the uh, pygidial gland, which is the defining characteristic that, that tells you if it's an ant or a wasp in the fossil record, it's got a pygidial gland, which is a little teeny gland on the back end of the ant that squirts something. Literally, we don't know what it does. The defining characteristic of an ant that distinguishes it from non-ants it's, it's got a pygidial gland that we don't know what it does in anything. Only five or six of them have been studied in a little bit of detail. It's assuming that it may squirt some kind of hormone, whether it's the same for all ants, we don't know. Um, and, and if you think about your average ant, how big is an ant? Go out, at the, I've got a infestation that's been there for, since the house was built and probably before. Uh, little bitty little ants that you, you see just a mound of the little things. So tiny little ants. How easy is it to take one of those little ants and look at its backside in a microscope and see where the little teeny gland is poking out on the backside of the little tiny ant that's smaller than a grain of sand or a rice thing? And that's independent of working out what the genes are. Uh, you'd have, uh, you'd have probably easier to do a genotype of the damn thing than to work out which genes interact to do what about making the pygidial gland and whatever it is that's shot out the vent. Um, oh, and Brian has put up a link, Scientific American, on um, insect metamorphosis evolution. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, needless to say, it's a fascinating subject matter. And if a creationist wants to make a big deal out of it, um, get caught up with more of the technical literature. And gradually, it's coming in onto the face. I, I I try to keep track of it as I've just did when looking through um, some of the technical papers. I think I did. Let me see whether or not I had a, a, a show on the subject. I seem to think. 
nothing is a Q word, so I may not have actually um, explicitly put a reference on it in a, in a show. Uh, it's one of those like the origin of life that because it's an ongoing new work, what can you do other than simply point to just the, the cutting edge material? It's unlikely, I'll do some, I'll put on my little prediction hat here. I think it's extremely unlikely that metamorphosis is involving a single system. That there's probably multiple dynamics that can get involved in the various levels of metamorphosis. So um, there's probably a great deal of um, non-homologous convergence as parallel systems working in individual lineages can come up with comparable solutions to this little issue. And the other issue is why do this, does the organism go through the rigmarole of shuffleboard, altering the thing? And what did it do before the metamorphosis kicked in? There is, by the way, a grade in arthropods of ones that really don't have a metamorphic stage at all versus the ones that do. And so I, I'm, I'm not right sure right, right off the bat um, just how basal metamorphosis is believed to be in arthropods. That's something where we need to have a, a bug on the thing. Brian Stevens, my spiders are not running the wheel fast enough. Yes, yes. I, I, I don't think that spiders work well as uh, social organisms. They have their own little thing and they want to do their own thing like devouring their mates and making webs and doing all sorts of little things. And um, uh, and especially in very large size, make spectacularly good terrifying creatures in um, uh, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Anybody that ain't afraid of spiders needs to be an arachnologist and that's their career because they're not afraid of spiders. Um, so anyway, yeah, the... Um, the metamorphosis issue, a fun thing to do when looking at creationists on metamorphosis is look and see what they think to cite on the subject. Is it basically a gee whiz argument where they say, ooh, look at this, isn't this amazing? And no one knows why. And the evolutionists cannot explain it. Uh, and they don't really offer any of the technical literature. So basically, they're just riffing as a gee whiz. Um, and let me know any, anybody that, that dives in and starts doing a, a, a study of the various uh, anti-evolutionist accounts of uh, probably a brain bug, who's a bug guy, uh, might want to do that as a, um, um, a hobby uh, to do some little videos to see how creationists deal with the metamorphosis issue or any aspect of insects. Um, because somebody that's already researched it at level, like a brain bug has, We'll, ha we'll know what better questions to ask. When I did the thing on ants for Evolution Slam Dunk, uh, I had to dive into the research on ants cold because I'm not a bug person. Uh, I'm uh, um, more into dinosaurs and the reptile mammal transition kind of slid into that and, and researching on a variety of, of areas. But you know, it's a thing that I wasn't really aware of. And so when I found out that no one knew what the hell the video glands do, suggested how difficult, oh, by the way, there's something like 20,000 species of ants, of which the vast majority of them are not characterized in great detail. So is there any surprise? We don't know a heck of a lot about a lot of things, but a lot of work to do for people who actually do like to do all that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, Schlade, love my spiders. Uh, they pay board by eating the mozzies and flies. There, there is a certain practical aspect to it. There's a small little a bits of, of spiders. There's one little spot in my basement where I'm almost guaranteed to see a little spider show up every once in a while waiting for prey. And other than that, once in a while, I'll be uh, looking on, and suddenly I'll look up on the ceiling in the living room and there's a spider on the ceiling. And I'm going, where did that come from? <laughs> and you always have to wonder whether or not, you know, how what, what spider does all night and he's wandering around wonderlust or or thinking, well, maybe that, that big space there, I'm just going to walk upside down across that person's ceiling and see what I can come up with. Um, but they're an amazingly durable group um, as uh, organisms go. Um, and either you love them or, or scare the deadlights out of it. My brother once um, caught a uh, tarantula back in the 60s and he sent it home to us in a box and when we opened it up on the on the driveway it scared the shit out of everybody and i think some neighbor kid finally took the damn thing and, and we said oh ho tee hee raymond don't do that again <laughs> uh, so you either love them or hate them 
Uh, but as organisms go, they're immensely successful in the same way that ants are. The reason why there are so many species of ants, uh, and I think somebody has guesstimated that the volume of ants on the planet is comparable to the volume of uh, human beings on the planet in terms of mass. So we can't complain about it. A uh, living spider means living food nest. Ooh. So uh, let me, uh, since we're just about a half an hour, let me uh, not forget the other half of the show, which has to do with good old Sal and um, his discussion of this uh, grog wallpaper. For those of you not aware of Sal Cordova, uh, as I said, he is a, a now sliding for no good reason into young earth creationism. He's very much an origins or bust obsessed person. He wants to look at what, the origin of life and all that. And uh, dangling around with a variety of uh, technical papers that somehow or other he thinks is a problem for evolution. And one of the ways along the time when he was doing a, um, a discussion with Dapper Dino, uh, and I'll be putting the, the YouTube link to that in the uh, description in due course, um, he brought up this paper on uh, by Grodwall on, um, I think it was called, The Theory Was Beautiful Indeed, The Rise and Fall uh, and Circulation of Maximizing Methods in Population Genetics. And it's really an interesting paper that Cordova probably should not have gone to his trouble to bring up because it actually is a really nice introduction and summary of the development of mathematical modeling in um, genetics starting back in the 1918 period and then moving into the development of the Darwinian synthesis and the back and forth as they a lot of it was starting out theoretical they didn't have genetic data initially and the overall paradigm that got abandoned was the presumption that fitness landscapes or fitness values would just ratchet up and once you get, you know, the, the evolution would make things ever more fit reaching an asymptote of perfection perhaps or at least a fixed level where it could never get any better but it was never going to go back and the more they started looking at the details of how living systems actually run and recognizing that you've a fitness landscape has so many variables in terms of the individual organism and its genes and its population and its predators and prey and parasites and environmental conditions and blah, that all of those attempts to measure that kind of fitness thing were really rough approximations at best. And so gradually, uh, some names have popped up uh, from the mathematics side. Uh, uh, Joseph Felsenstein, who is also a big critic of intelligent design, um, and uh, Matur Kimura, that came up with neutral mutation theory, and uh, Richard Lewontin, who uh, a, a big geneticist that's associated with Jerry Coyne today and still active in the field. Um, those and a bunch of others, Stephen Jay Gould gets mentioned along the way, and, and Sewell Wright, and uh, uh, Fisher, and, and a whole bunch of uh, people and it's a really wonderful paper which thank you sal for bringing it to my attention uh you probably shouldn't have done that <laughs> because it explains things really well and clarifies an awful lot of issues and if you thought that somehow or other um that paper was was a problem for the current model uh of um evolutionary thinking and how they have improve their notions of uh, you know, equilibrium and disequilibrium and linkage and all these other factors that they've had to incorporate to make better and better understandings of how biology works that was probably not the right paper to cite because it's it's very nice useful that's about 40 pages long altogether and so i'll be putting a link up to that so that you'll be able to download that in fact anybody uh, that gets involved in, in the genetic issue it, it's uh, that's unfamiliar with it coming at it from the outside will find it a very nice summary of the players and the issues back and forth as well as a discussion of, of the technical issues and what formulas were used and why one uh, uh, didn't work as well as another uh, oh uh, uh, Hamilton's uh, um, uh, kin selection there's a whole bunch of stuff going in there it's it's really a wonderfully uh, good summary paper so uh, thank you, Sal, for scavenging around for ammunition and thinking that somehow or other this is a problem for evolution. No, no, no. Uh, that isn't how it works. Um, and the fact that so many of these things are directly available, that's another actually a, a relevant lesson to remember, is that um, creationists can sometimes be poking around and find stuff and they thrust it under your nose. And they shouldn't. 
in the same way that, that Daniel Jensen, I've mentioned in previous weeks, how he would bring up subjects and cite technical literature in some of his more technical footnote laden notes uh, on basic biology that actually are bringing up topics that he shouldn't be bringing up, uh, including fossil record of organisms and others. So you can use um, a, a creationist resource as a springboard because sometimes they're bringing up topics and alert, allude, uh, alluding to relatively obscure technical papers. I hadn't known about this little puppy before. It's, it's in a history of science uh, journal. It's not in a regular one. It's not one I would have ever encountered in nature or science. It's not in there. Uh, so um, you discover all sorts of side issues that can be very, very useful. And there's lots of different ways to skin the old cat. The main thing is um, is follow up on it. So when people give you links to things, uh, take a point of looking and seeing what's going on. Uh, right now, I'm in the, uh, just before I started up the show, um, I was uh, uh, doing some research on uh, the uh, bombardier beetle issue, which is going to pop up in second um, rocks volume, or um, yeah, second rocks, and. Um, uh, it's a cutie because it connects up with fire-breathing dragon ideas and all that. I'm not making this up. Uh, Dwayne just tried to do that kind of an argument. And uh, it turns out there's some brand new research that's been done. And David Copez, the prickly little creationist, has been riffing off of it. And so this is stuff from 2020, so it's quite, quite recent. And um, I wouldn't have known about that had I not undertaken a follow-up research based upon the material that I had in, in, that I'd already written on the Bombardier Beetle previously, and to see, well, what's happened since? So a thing to remember on any topic, if you had done work on it, compiled material or had read stuff that's 20, 30 years old, um, immediately go, uh, where are they now? And so uh, do some poking around on where the research has happened. Uh, gone since then, uh, were ideas being presented that sounded like they might be pretty good at the time, but fizzled out because there's not been any follow up on it. All of that stuff you can do relatively easily uh, online to get caught up speed. And that way now you can see where the landscape had moved from where your original work is. So never rest on your lawyer, law, blah, 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 laurels, uh, assuming you have laurels to rest on. Um, however accurate. A presentation might have been, as I did with the um, Bombardier Beetle material in 2004, there's been work since. And uh, it's really quite nice uh, to find out about. Uh, Matthew Price asks, uh, do you know if anyone has done a comprehensive review of Evolution's Achilles heel? Uh, not entirely. I That that one actually only, let's see if I've got a, uh, um, I'm trying to even remember who wrote the bloody thing. And um, I seem to recall it's from a relatively minor creationist. Um, was that guy from Germany, Werner? Uh, is he the one that did that? Uh, people come up with, with new material all the time. And uh, the best thing to do is if nobody has done an analysis of it, dive in. No one's stopping you. So if you have a copy of the book, uh, you can do a source analysis. If you have access to a camera and you want to do YouTube, bingo, I can do it. Get on uh, uh, um, the uh, Restream uh, or Zoom or whatever you want to do to generate the material you want, and away we go. Uh, Creation Myth says, uh, that one's got a bunch of chapters each by a different specialist, I think. Aha, yes, Creation Myth. Hi there, Dan. How are you doing? Um, see, now there's an example uh, of where uh, if I don't know about it, that doesn't mean somebody else doesn't know about it. So, frankly, somebody that wants to dive into that is an excellent example to do, especially if it lacks a bibliography or uh, index. And that means that anyone trying to do an analysis of it is hampered by the very fact, just as I was in these other books, of the fact that how do you find out where they mention something? Unless you have a, a document file of it or a PDF that you can scan for text uh, appearance, and that's not always available, uh, how do you find out if they mention paper X or didn't mention paper X or a particular topic X if it doesn't have an index and it doesn't have a reference list? So, um, ah, see, you can have crazy mitts. Hang on, let me pull it up. Um, and so that 
that's the approach that somebody who is well enough of, uh, knowledgeable on that area and has access to the book, dive into it, do something on it. If, if uh, creation myths, you got the thing, uh, if you want to do it cooperatively with somebody else, I'm happy to help on that. Um, uh, maybe we could do all that uh, together. So, for example, you have a copy of it that you can get the information to me and yeah, uh, hunt the material up. Um, it's a useful thing to, to, to deal with uh, because it makes it way faster. I know Erica was helped by the fact that I had already compiled a, a reference list for Rupin Sanford's Contested Bones. So that means she didn't have to go hunting around to find out what all was in the book. She could then apply her understanding of primates and go, oh, wait a minute there. Oh, they, uh, yeah, that's where they mentioned that on page so-and-so. And that speeds up the process. So, uh, so, so it's an anthology work. Okay. Um, the, um, I will predict that the book in question will not show any Achilles heels. I would predict that a great deal of it will be retread from previous authors that are involved in it. I will predict that its uh, awareness of relevant technical literature will probably be no better than what we can see with Jensen and Tompkins and Sanford and that crowd. Oh, some genetic entropy stuff is in there? Well, yes, that is deserving of a yawn. Um, Matthew Price says, that's not a bad idea. I have a copy too. There's also a documentary. Are there any online classes where I can learn how to do a source analysis? Oh, it's so much simpler than that, dear boy. Oh, Matthew, 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 no classes are quite required. Um, uh, what you've been seeing me do all the way along is, you know, you're looking at a work. So there I've got the work and there's got footnotes. And so you look where the footnote is. Some of them are the, at the bottom of the page. Others are like the way they are in this book. They're at the end of the book. So you go back to the back of the book. And you put down the reference, find out exactly what it is, create a little doc file like I do. Um, and you put that in as document one and what page it's on. And then the little note you want to put in as to what is being done for commentary. Then you find out, do you know what that source says? What does the book claim the source says versus what does the source actually say? So that means you have to get access to the source. If you can um, do that. Bingo. Now you can read the material, find out whether is it being used for authority quoting? Is it being used as uh, uh, just a backstop, relevant, you know, uh, um, generic information? An awful lot of the first third of uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, of Jensen's book was just non controversial. But he was also bringing up topics that you wouldn't know that he was actually skating on thin ice unless you read the original paper. So this is not incredibly complicated to do. It's time uh, consuming because uh, you may or may not have immediate access to the technical literature. Uh, but at any rate, what you all you need to do is to compile that reference bibliography. Unless the book already has one, that simplifies the task. Um, then you might actually want to jump over if it doesn't doing it in index to main, maybe compile one of your own to make it easier to be able to locate where the information is. So it all depends. Uh, oh, creation says seven is cosmology by Hartnett, eighth is ethics and morality. Um, yeah, and uh, but I, I'd give you the authors, but I fell asleep reading the title of the chapter. <laughs> yeah, I can anticipate what a lot of the material is even without looking at the book. Uh, Hart pops up as a name that's familiar, um, that it sounds like a bunch of people either from ICR or AIG, and there's an awful lot of overlap between the two, that they're basically retreading material that's probably already been posted in other contexts. There is an astonishing amount of duplication in anti-evolution. So um, the uh, this book here looks like it's uber original, but in fact, virtually everything in it has been recycled at some point or another in the technical articles that Jensen posts up at, at the Answers Research Journal. So nobody needs to buy this stupid book. You'll be able to get virtually all of Jensen's arguments freebie at Answers in Genesis website and Creation Ministries International website, all that stuff in PDFs and HTMLs or anything like that. So unless you are made of money, and even if you are made of money, don't buy books and give them money when you don't need to. Um, um, Matthew, I got you. I appreciate your answering my questions. I could probably get access to the sources they fight to my university. Absolutely. 
if you are already associated with a university, their librarians will bend over backwards to have you on all of that stuff. And what they don't have in their direct stacks, they will be able to get through the various uh, electronic media. If you are associated with a university, you have a doorway and you will probably be able to get easy peasy quickly PDFs that you can download onto a flash drive or whatever the way you want to do that. Plus all the stuff that you can get online and contact us one way or another. We're going to get you the source unless it's really obscure and difficult to find. In some cases, there, uh, and it depends on the discipline. It will be different if you're talking about biology material. Odds are most of that's available online. Almost all the technical journals, and Dan can say otherwise what, what he would think about it. It's harder for some of the geology material and paleontology. Some of the journals aren't open access and not quite so easy to get at. Other cases may be obscure journals that have gone out of business in the last 20 years and may only have hard copies and may never have been put online. There were several examples of things that I discovered my university had hard copies of those journals and none, it's unavailable online, but I could make a photocopy, which I could then create a PDF of and email to myself at no cost, even though I haven't been with the Eastern Washington University officially, I'm, I'm an ex-student. Nonetheless, I'm just Joe Blow walking in from the street, they help, and, and it requires no cost at all. So. Uh, by all means, uh, take advantage of the people there at the university and library. They will they will be absolutely delightful to help you track down material. Now, other things like historical stuff, um, I had to look up a, a bit about the uh, Babylonian tractate and the Jerusalem tractate, the various commentaries on the Talmud uh, that uh, was being alluded to in some discussions um, quite a long time ago about um, biblical matters. Happens Gonzaga University has a gigantic Judaica section. <laughs> so bingo, you can just go there and there is this stuff. You can look up the material, boop, 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 and, and, um, and if you need to make photocopies, you know, do it away. So there's lots of ways of doing this. Do not be intimidated by sources. It's not rocket science. It's the simple matter of you make claim X and there's source Y. And uh, source methods was popping up I'm going to get political here. Source methods has come up in the impeachment trial where uh, the people, um, uh, the Democrats making their case um, pointed out that uh, the um, uh, Trump's um, uh, brief um, cited only one legal scholar that the impeachment uh, was of a, somebody after they left office was wrong. And it turned out that that source, the one and only one they cited, had not actually said that. And they left out relevant information and that the person who wrote the article, a book, explicitly pointed out that he had been misrepresented. Well, wow, that's exactly the kind of behavior we see with creationists uh, and ideologues of all types who try to authority quote the source. And then you look up what the source is and it doesn't say what they say it does. Bingo. And then. Turn about fair play. Um, the um, uh, Democrats had relied on a, um, a particular statement that they'd gotten from regular media from, I think, Representative or Senator uh, Lee. And Lee had a conniption fit. He said, I didn't really say that. And so they were having a back and forth um, just a few hours ago uh, to have that removed from their argument because he was contending that that wasn't a factual thing. That's all source methods, exactly the same procedure. Is where are you getting information from? Is the information accurate? If it's a secondary source, always be more skeptical of it. Even a primary source technical material isn't an oracle. It has to have evidence. It needs to offer what the case is. So uh, pay a difference between stuff that he's put in a technical journal and it, is it a prominent technical journal or an obscure technical journal that is kind of pay for play and they'll publish practically anything if you give them money. There are journals that are like that. And you often find very controversial things showing up in very obscure journals or the notorious case of uh, Lee Spetner and Fred Hoyle and that when they were complaining about Archaeopteryx being a fraud back in the 1970s. Where was it published? In a photography journal. It wasn't published in a technical journal. That should be warning flags going over. Wait a minute, why is this in a, in a journal of photography? Um, so all of that, um, uh, hello, yes, hello, Festa, back from serving the community. Um, the uh, uh, Brian Stevens put up a link to uh, evaluating online sources. Excellent. 
Um, it's, this is all basic source methodology. I learned it in college from a historiography class. I'll type that word out because it's one you may not have heard all that often. Historiography, which is study of history. In other words, not the history that they wrote, but the study of the historians writing history and how history interpretations changed over time and all of that. And that's when I really got, uh, oh my, Vesta says, darn cold here, minus 27 uh, centigrade. Oh, down with a wind chill of minus 40. Yikes, down to 55. Well, stay inside. Yes, that's not good at all. That's that's beyond nippy. That's a uh, uh, witch's tit frozen uh, temperature. Woo. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, but all of that 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 source methodology, it's the same thing you would do in real life. Say you want to buy a new refrigerator, and you go and you look at the refrigerator and you see some information on the front of the thing. And you find out what the cost of it is and what features it has and what electric usage it is. And maybe you'd check to see what Consumer Reports had to say about the refrigerator. You'd find out whether or not they've got a reputation for quality or not. Uh, um, and um, uh, bit by bit, you get a sense of what it is before you shell your money out. That's You would do it with cars. You'd do it with cameras. Uh, every single bit of that. And it's functionally the same kind of thing that you deal with. Uh, in terms of stats and details when sports people pay attention to how the soccer team is doing and what is the the uh, 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 football uh, stats of uh, the pass and receiver and Tom Brady's activities in the Super Bowl and all of that. That's also data analysis. That's empirical data field. Uh, but nobody, nobody would say, well, we stopped the game in the halftime and we're ahead, so that means we win. And we're not going to count any more scores after that, okay? And we'll send a mob to the Super Bowl to force the game to stop uh, to make sure that our side wins. Uh, no, that's bad method. So it's exactly the same kind of dynamic that goes on uh, with that. Uh, that I, I come from a history background, not science background. But it's exactly the same principle. Um, legal briefs, that may... Get your eye. You want to get your eyes glaze over? Read legal documents. <laughs> Only when I was studying it, the very first time I did a debate, which was oh yikes, six seven years ago, um, uh, and I think I got a link to it at my website um, uh, about it. It was on the Grease v. Galloway prayer case, which was just about to be decided at the time. And I hadn't really paid a heck of a lot of attention to how legal arguments were put up, but I was about to debate a law professor, so I better figure this out in a hurry. Unfortunately, all of his papers were available online on this particular topic, and so I was able to <coughs> get up to speed pretty quickly. And there I just discovered legal documents are three times bigger than they need to be. I actually kind of bumped into that before, but what it is legal, the, the Procedure of legal, instead of having like an abstract as a science article does, and then there's things on methods, and then there's a discussion at the end of it, and then there's references and footnotes and supplementary material. There's a whole structural form you get into. Legal documents tell you what they're going to tell you, and then they tell you, and then afterwards they summarize what they just told you. And it turns out those are about the same size. In other words, the time it takes them to tell you is the same size as the here's what we're going to tell you. And the here's what we just told you. Part. That's why legal papers that are 90 pages long are probably only about 25 or 30 pages of actual content. And it's just repeated three times. Once you get past that, you realize, oh, OK, this is boring and stupid. But now you understand the procedure. So you can see through that the, the tracking that you're getting in that first third is going to be virtually repeated with only slight modifications in the other two parts. Once you get past the nomenclature and structure, then away you go. Tell you what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. That's the lawyer. Exactly. That's not what you get in science papers and, and in other dynamics. And so uh, a thing, because I came from a history background, I was used to detailed background footnotes that you don't find in science books at all. But in history books, particularly older history books, because I'm an old fart, so I'm coming from the 1960s. Um, that scholarly works would often have long discretionary footnotes at the back of the book explaining the ins and outs of a little minor detail. 
They don't do that anymore. And I basically gave that up. If you see the Troubles in Paradise postings uh, that I have up on my website, that's what I was doing in my initial writing. I don't do it that way anymore. So my books, boom, boom, are written in a modern style, which pulls the information apart and makes it easily accessible to somebody that's not used to seeing long digressionary footnotes. And so what became, what would have been a digressionary footnote has become a info box, with a little box around it, which is the case in Rocks Were There. I hadn't figured that one out on, on Evolution Slam Dunk. So we all learn. Um, one bit or another. Uh, David asked, asked if you just see my latest video. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not sure what your latest video was, so I cannot say. And uh, I do, I, I am subscribed to you. So um, um, th these things do pop up and we can all do that. But anyway, whoever was bringing up the question back there, I won't scroll back to find out. On um, um, Evolution's Achilles Heel, um, get together with some people on it. If you've got the copies of the book yourself, do it as a team if necessary, you know, so you can uh, have a version of effort. Um, and if you have access to be able to do a video version of it, run with it and make it available and we can share the material around so that we can um, see what's going on on it. I would wager most of what's in that book, if it's like what typically comes up in creationist apologetics isn't original, that it's just retreading, especially an anthology book. It's probably just retreading stuff that's already been in other contexts. This is true of almost every discipline. I mean, the, the average anthology paper, a book in a lot of uh, even geology are things that are probably stuff that's already been done as published articles prior to that. Time. So there we go. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, creation myths just up. Uh, we, we will point out creation myths is a new daddy. And so he's got it. Oh, teeny baby. And therefore, to be a college professor who does occasional videos cr criticizing creationists and as a new baby, well, the baby gets top priority, the college educating part gets the next part, and then the doing the videos and commenting on stuff and watching other people's videos, that's down the down the, the bed. Uh, so there we go. Um, um, mentioning uh, got a couple of downvotes. Um, that's to be expected. You've got probably some people, especially if you're, the more prominent you get, there's some, you're going to have a following of people who can't stand you. And they will go in and they will give the thumbs down automatically, like a reflex. And they may not even bother watching it. In the same way, how many creationists are there that, that see the title of the paper and they think they know what it means or maybe what the abstract is without reading the whole paper and they just repeat it without bothering that? Dan, uh, Erica, there's a whole bunch of us who know exactly by firsthand Jackson, uh, people who do that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, boop, 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 boop. Ah, so David is the last one is uploaded on genetics and young earth creationism. Uh, yeah, the, um, the genetics issue is a good one to have lots of people involved in, especially ones who have direct experience in genetics as Dan and others do, because, um, that's the meat and potatoes of what evolution is doing. So just like that question about metamorphosis, ultimately is a question of genetics and biology, developmental biology, Evo Devo. And that means that the, the more familiar you are with it and the good ability to explain what it means to outsiders, always remember that a big chunk of your audience is not gonna have the foggiest idea what term, the technical terminology are. And so the ability to uh, um, having a, a thing where if a, a specialized term is mentioned, um, somebody in the live chat like this can say, what the hell is that? And you can explain it. So an, a good interaction back and forth between the people in the live chat and what's going on if you're doing a live show. If you're doing a pre-arranged show that's then posted as a complete already done thing, uh, Jackson and others do that where it's not a live chat where you're running riffing off at the moment. Uh, that's a different dynamic. And um, also, um, if you have a theatrical experience, that can come in handy. It's no coincidence that Nick Zentner, who is one of the neatest explainers as a college professor on geology, uh, started out in theater. And then he got the geology bug, and that's what he's got his uh, degree in. But nonetheless, he has that capacity to figure out what he needs to do to engage and interact with the audience as kind of like an improv riff. You, if you think about a live lecture as an improv, um, so that you have a set of information you're going to present, 
but you need to be able to wing it on the fly and uh, riff well. Uh, theatrical training can be very helpful. It gets you comfortable in front of audiences and all that kind of stuff. Um, David said, I prefer more than up and down because some videos I don't really like, but I don't really dislike either. Yeah, there's some that, that um, do you, and especially a debate. How do you rate a debate? Do you rate the debate because one side is really good and obliterated the other side, but the other side is so unbelievably stupid? Do you want to give a plus to that? You, know, you want to give a plus to the person you that did the best and a down to the one who did badly. So you need actually a, the ability to differentiate that. You can't do that uh, on uh, YouTube. So there we go. So do we got any uh, um, questions? We've, uh, we've been on for about an hour in here before I drone on to, uh, uh, to uh, Creation Myth. Keep up the fight, RJ. Yes, night all. Yes, and take care of the little baby. And uh, if we have no questions, then I will put up the commercial for um, the Rocks for their book. Let me get that structured here. I have to remember what I'm doing on there. Uh, this takes a tiny little bit of setup there. I would like to thank again our dear friend um, Peter for having created the. Um, there we go. I'll put up our little thing. Let's get our show going on the road while I talk because you cannot hear any of this. Um, the sound oddly does not come through the screen. There's some jaunty music behind that. Uh, this uh, the book that um, Jackson and I wrote. We're very proud of. We will be doing a volume two. It's um, thoroughly indexed, aha, uh -huh. beautifully documented with thousands of sources, up to date. It uh, demolishes a variety of creationists, and there's yet more to demolish for volume two. Uh, we're very uh, proud of the thing. It's um, got a lot of humor to it because. So many things the creationists say is bloody stupid, but it's also serious because it relates to sound method, um, how science works as a discipline, and why we're pissed off at the idea that creationists should be misrepresenting material and that there would be oodles and oodles of people who nonetheless insist on mangling that material and not fact checking on it. So um, uh, it's a, a good. Um, introduction, uh, it, it introduces an awful lot of the players on the field that uh, you may or may not be uh, familiar with, and it's an ongoing project. So uh, we'll all that. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, Brian Stevens, can we talk on Corvette some more? Probably not tonight. Yes, the, uh, um, the uh, development. Now, if it ever reaches the stage where automobiles can breed and can mate, then natural selection would kick in as to and sexual selection and buyer selection as to what would be uh, the features that would be selected for that are inherited and you have to have inheritance so simply cloning uh can't produce a heck of a lot of evolution unless it can mutate the pieces and uh, those are very very um, um side issues anyway um uh, when i get the linkages uh, once the uh, thing finalizes i'll put all the links to the stuff in there uh download that technical paper uh, by uh, 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 godwall Gradwall. it's uh, really a beautiful introduction i think anybody even at the college level that looks through will find it a useful summary to where they go oh okay that's where fisher was coming in and that's why there was that debate uh, over that uh and it, it traipses across decades a lot of this was now starting to settle in even though it's written in 2017, you'll notice these stops in the 1980s because a lot of these issues have just become um, irrelevant in the sense that we now have figured out more about how things work. So we've now pressed on, which Sal has it. So um, everybody stay uh, uh, safe, um, uh, wear your masks, um, uh, don't go around accepting any wooden penguins, and uh, we'll see you all uh, next week. Um, stay safe all.